pandemics are going to be an ongoing thing of the future. Superbugs, pandemics, they have been a disturbing part of humanity from time immemorial. From the Antoine Plague in the year 165, the Bubonic Plague in 1347, the Spanish Flu in 1918, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. At this rate, experts warn superbugs are here to stay and will happen more frequently. Are we ready? We should have had much better, much earlier warning about the devastation that COVID was going to bring to our shores. Our health care is at a breaking point. And in Canada, our public health system really needs to be strengthened so that we can face these pandemics and come out of them in one piece. Children are falling behind with school closures. The pandemic has created a global crisis in education. One in three Canadians are struggling with their mental health. With COVID, it's like isolation, not seeing people. Those are the exact opposite things I needed in order to heal myself. The global church is questioning its role in society. And the divide between the richest and the poorest has grown. COVID has really sharply exposed inequities in our society. What lessons have we learned from COVID? Will this generation recover from the long-lasting impacts of this pandemic? And will we have time to make the necessary changes before the next pandemic hits? I think the federal government's view was that they would wait out COVID and then learn lessons. That's really not the reality of global pandemics anymore. They can come anytime from anywhere. This week on Context, a future with super butts. Welcome to Context, I'm Maggie John. The new Institute for Pandemics at the University of Toronto aims to help the world better prepare for the next superbug. Dr. Nelson Lee is the interim director and joins me now. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Lee. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Lee, will there be more pandemics in our immediate future? Well, I certainly hope not. But our experience tells us that very likely there will be epidemics and even pandemics in the future, though not necessarily of this scale. Uh, in fact, I would say that uh, roughly COVID-19 is the 10th pandemic or large scale epidemic in the past century. We have four uh, influenza pandemics, uh, the earliest one being 1918, the latest one, the most recent one, 2009. We have got SARS-1 in 2003 and some regional epidemics like the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, uh, avian influenza, Zika, Ebola, you name it. Uh, so pandemics happen because of the emergence of a novel pathogen, because which can spread easily from person to person. And in human populations with no or very little immunity, it can, it can spread and cause a pandemic. And science tells us that uh, these pandemics could be preventable, at least the threats minimized, but there are lots of works that need to be done. Mm. When the Omicron variant was first detected in South Africa, um, within a week it had spread throughout the world. With how transmissible this particular virus is, how important is it for a country like Canada to help the Global South get vaccines? Well, uh, I think that the emergence of uh, Omicron has clearly illustrated to us that we cannot achieve good pandemic control unless most of the global population has been vaccinated. So vaccine equity is, is a very important but a huge topic, uh, I'm sure uh, we all understand. And it requires global efforts to address these challenges, such as global supply, distribution, uh, vaccine wastage, intellectual property rights, uh, and international uh, initiatives such as COVAX, led by international organizations and WHO, uh, has been working on these issues. Absolutely. One of your specialties is forecasting the course of the pandemic. As we see variants like Delta and Omicron spread, will there be more variants? And, and what does your research show on the future of COVID? Well, well thank you for the question. Uh, I think that many people are interested in this. Uh, I would say that many scientists, including myself, think that the most likely scenario is that the pandemic will gradually transition into an epidemic disease, uh, which means it's got periodic season, seasonal waves with lower activities in between, a situation similar to epidemic influenza. It's because of the continuous evolution of the virus. Uh, say we've got alpha, beta, delta, omicron, and there would be more. And, and our immunity 
is generally short lasting and then in, incomplete for, for these viruses. So I would say that as the collective immune experience in the population from vaccination and natural infection combined accumulates over time, uh, we can expect a lesser impact. But very likely, the epidemic waves in future can still cause excessive deaths and hospitalizations with varying severity depending on this variant immunity interaction. So does that mean, you know, as we, we've had ways of protecting ourselves from COVID, from masks and vaccines, are both of these tools going to be an ongoing then part of our future, especially as we see these vari more variants come about? Well, yes. Uh, okay. I mean, especially for vaccine, yes. In, in immediate terms, I think that every eligible individual should receive a uh, booster dose. Uh, it's been shown to be 60% to 80% effective in preventing infection and nearly 95% or even more against hospitalization and death. And it's from Ontario and international data. And reduced infection also means reduced transmission. So I think that uh, in, in immediate terms, we should uh, increase our booster coverage. But as the virus continues to evolve and as the immunity will wane over time, we may need to adapt a vaccine component to match with the circulating virus strain. For example, in the future, there could be something like Omicron-specific uh, vaccine. And in the long run, to develop broad-spectrum, longer-lasting vaccines, like such as a pan-coronavirus vaccine. And it's reasonable to expect that we may need to receive at least an annual dose of a COVID vaccine similar to flu shot. Mm. For masks, uh, I would say that uh, besides vaccine, masks is another very effective tool in reducing transmission. Uh, and in a study recently released by CDC just a few days ago, consistent use of masks indoor uh, in the public settings will significantly reduce risk of infection. 66% with medical grade masks and up to 83% with respirators uh, and lowest with cloth masks. So I think that new, in near future, virus when the virus is still widely circulating in our community, wearing a mask is still a good idea. Uh, I hope that we're heading towards uh, a day when we can start re-evaluating this recommendation. Yeah. Uh, when the extent of transmission in the location is reduced with better ventilation, access to testing and widely available oral form of antiviral treatment at home, and then we may be able to uh, re-evaluate recommendation. Last question for you, Dr. Lee. How do we prepare for the next pandemic? Well, I, I think that um, it's actually important to get ready now. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we, we know that uh, epidemics and pandemics will, will happen again. So I think that we need more investments in public health infrastructures. We need a better surveillance program to look at the emergence of infections in our community and how bad it is, including the use of newer technologies and methods. For example, uh, using information technology, using sewage testing and other novel methods. Uh, we need to establish an early warning system, early detection and identification of disease outbreaks. Uh, and of course, we need to pay attention uh, to the human animal interface and we call it a one health approach to reduce the risk of emergence of these uh, novel pathogens. Uh, and secondly, we think that we need to improve and streamline our nation's data infrastructure. Uh, we all understand that public health is an information game and it's really important to get more uh, comprehensive and accurate data. And of course, we need to uh, do more research too. And hopefully there will be more funding for research development in detecting and stopping emerging disease threats, uh, to evaluate the effectiveness and impacts of these public health intervention, uh, interventions, uh, look at the decision uh, making tools, policies, uh, equitable um, uh, policies, and to support those uh, who are most in need um, to ensure that no one is left behind. And of course, uh, lastly, vaccine research and manufacturing capacities. So there are lots to do, yeah. and we better start now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson Lee, for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you. 
the largest disruption of education in history. The UN Secretary General has even called it a generational catastrophe. More than one billion students have been affected globally by disrupted education. And my next guest says if things don't change soon, she fears for the five million school children in this country. Dr. Prachi, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Maggie. You say there is no excuse for Canada to still be closing down schools in the midst of this pandemic, especially when there is clear global data on the importance of education continuity in the midst of societal disruption. Explain this for us. Well, I think um, early on in March of 2020, when countries took the decision to close schools, it was a rational decision at the time because we really didn't know the how the uh, virus was transmitted. We had no data. We had no treatments. Um, the situation is markedly different now. Um, and given the length of school closures, especially in a province like Ontario, we have to be very careful in terms of how to make sure that education can be continued in a way that is feasible um, and in a way that is actually uh, going to meet the needs of the children and the youth. How does educational disruption impact children? There have been studies that have come out uh, globally and also here in, in Canada, uh, smaller scale studies that show, uh, of course, learning loss. Uh, it could be anywhere between uh, two months to two years, depending on the system, depending on the study, depending on the subject that we're looking at. Uh, but there are also other issues around uh, delayed uh, socialization, social skills, mental health effects. Um, and these are clear uh, issues that are coming out of uh, protracted disruption. There's also a disruption of other services because schools are a hub uh, of, uh, you know, other services, therapeutic and diagnostic counseling services. And without those, it's actually very difficult for families to be able to access the care that they need um, and also for students to develop in, in the way that we would like them uh, that, that, that they should. How do we prepare ourselves for the next pandemic then when it comes to our education and the future of our children? I think the first thing is to think about the recovery plan as to, and, and really to focus again, if we truly value um, our, our education system, if we value our children, if we value our future, we have to invest and we have to invest quickly. Um, and we have to invest in a way that is going to promote recovery um, so that we can match up our values with our plan. So what, what are three things that we should do? The first is we should look throughout the system in every province and actually look to see which parts of the curriculum of the current grade should be lengthened, which parts should be brought into the next grade and which parts from the previous grade should be brought should be brought into this grade because it is a continuous progressive system if you have a disruption for any length of time and children who started the pandemic for example in grade two in march of 2020 they're going to be in grade five by the time september 22 comes around so it's a significant disruption when we do that we need to be attuned to all of the the differences across the grades and that needs to be done all the way through uh, kindergarten, early years, through the end of secondary. And then the second thing we should be doing is boosting core skills, literacy, numeracy, critical thinking skills for every grade across the board in, the pro in, in every province across this country and infusing psychosocial skills into the curriculum, uh, again, for every grade across the country. Um, as a real recovery plan, we know that there have been uh, losses in coping mechanisms, children have faced mental health effects, mm -hmm. negative men mental health effects, we need to take uh, into consideration those. And the third thing is, we should be prioritizing schools in communities that are marginalized. I just did an analysis of data in Ontario, and we found that schools in marginalized areas, elementary schools in marginalized areas, had more cumulative incidences. We should be targeting those schools for more interventions and targeted interventions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Prachi, for your insights today. Thanks for having me on the show.
Canadians faring two years into this pandemic. According to a recent Centre for Addiction and Mental Health report, anxiety and feelings of depression and loneliness are at their highest levels. Addictions have increased as well. How much more can we take? Registered psychotherapist Andrea Gruenwald is here to discuss. Thanks for joining us today, Andrea. Hey, thanks, Maggie. So, Andrew, the whole premise of this show is to look back and to look forward as well. Uh, severe anxiety, loneliness, and feelings of depression have increased among women, but only slightly for men during this pandemic. Why do you think that is? Well, I think systemically we still have some issues. Uh, we've seen some growth in, the, in this area, but we still have some challenges in terms of women end up taking a lot of the responsibility at home for the unpaid work, taking care of the children. And so uh, we know that, you know, women are in the workforce as well. And so they're trying to manage work. They're trying to manage their children. They're trying to manage all of these things at the same time. It's very, very stressful. And in addition to that, I would say they're having to make hard choices. They're, they're, they're having or being put into positions of having to choose between taking care of their children or doing their job. And it's a very stressful, uh, anxiety provoking situation for them. And how much of this is a feeling of hopelessness and a lack of control? I know when I hear of another variant on the news, my heart skips a beat and I automatically yeah. think about lockdowns. And so how much of exactly. this is hopelessness? I think that's a great word is hopelessness. I think there's something called learned hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Learned hopelessness is when we try and do things and it doesn't produce a change. And so, you know, with a lot of the restrictions that have been imposed on us by government and other things for health reasons, I think many of us have had that feeling of lack of control and it doesn't matter sort of what we do or, or um, what solutions we implement, it's not making a difference. And so that hopelessness and learned hopelessness is, is happening a lot for a lot of people. According to a McMaster study, 48% of caregivers are managing their child's anxiety and stress. What are the long-term effects for children out of this that we're going to see out of this pandemic? Well, I'd like to be optimistic and say that I think what we're going to see is increased resilience. Mm. Uh, we're going to see kids uh, learning how to manage stress in positive ways. Hopefully, caregivers are uh, modeling, you know, naming and identifying feelings. Uh, helping children to recognize them, name them, and still have to do their responsibility and what they need to do in, in the face of that. So I'm hoping optimistically that we'll build resiliency and that kids will, will have a takeaway of, of being stronger uh, coming out of this pandemic. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your time today. You're welcome. Coming up, the Q panel weighs in. How has the church handled the pandemic? Is it ready for the next superbug? What are the lessons we need to learn? We will discuss. In Northern Nigeria, in one case, we had a report and testimony saying that uh, Christian communities, they get six times less than their neighbors, their Muslim neighbors. And generally speaking, people may come to churches, not only uh, for prayers, but in difficult times, they will also come for support in terms of medicine, in terms of basic foods. But because of the pandemic, church leaders, they are no longer in that position to provide this really needed support they used to provide to communities around them. So let's pray for wisdom. Let's pray for these churches to continue to stand in the midst of persecution, in the midst of the pandemic, and in the midst of unknown. That was Aliyah Jadi from Open Doors International explaining how COVID has impacted Christians in Sub-Saharan Africa who are already vulnerable to persecution. This is the reality for the global church. Let's have the Q panel weigh in into this discussion. Jackie, Brian and Moira are back. Today we're talking superbugs, pandemics and lessons learned. Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, the Big C Church has been shaken to its core through this pandemic. What lessons have we learned, if any, from this? That's a great question. I think I think one one thing that we've learned um, is 
I think the importance of actually gathering together, I think many of us take that for granted that we can gather together as a body and, and come together for the sacraments and for worship and so on. And so the loss of that, I actually think, and I hope will make it more acute, uh, that desire for us. Another lesson that I think we learned is that churches can be creative, uh, and that may be good for preparation uh, for those who are in, say, persecuted places that they know they could be creative, meet in smaller groups, smaller houses. I think that's on the positive side. Um, on the negative side, I think we have, uh, uh, we have seen places where we have failed to properly catechize and form our, our parishioners in terms of engagement with the relationship of the church with political authorities. I think we've seen it um, uh, some who uh, have acted in certain ways that I think are inappropriate uh, and other ways have are inappropriately um, accepted some of these things. And so I think there's some work to do um, for the church across the world in terms of engaging with, with public, uh, you know, public affairs. And I think we've seen that as well. How about you, Moira? Thoughts on how, what the church has learned through this pandemic? Uh, good what it's learned and what it's still learning, I think, in terms of my own church. I mean, there's lots of discussions about what should happen next and how can we be prepared. I think from many points of view, and maybe especially as a bioethicist, we've, our church has really been concentrating a lot on the health issues, and especially in, in, a, in our own country, the whole question of long-term care homes. And so the treatment in the long-term care homes, from the point of view of medicine, but also from the point of view of how we view elderly people, which is a much more Christian approach. The, the whole question of their worth, their dignity, and the way that, that many nations just seem to have confined them you know, to some of these places without visitors, without proper care, sometimes an atrocious level of care. And the fact that this actually happens in a reasonably sophisticated country I think we've all learned a lot about uh, how we view the elderly, which again is another focus that Pope Francis very often you know, uh, takes to, so that, so that we recognize that we really are still worthy, worthy of care from beginning to, to the very end. It, the importance of our elderly in our community is so important. Jackie, have we lost sight of what it means to be the church in the midst of all of the hurdles that we've been going through over the past two years? Do we have to go through a deconstruction of our faith in order to recalibrate and understand who we are? I think that this pandemic has really shifted so many perspectives. Every workplace, every family, every community, and every church is now starting to think about what their role is when our lives look so different from what they looked like two years ago. And one of the things that excites me is the ability for the church to think about this and to strategically now be able to position themselves in people's lives. What role do they now hold? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was really happy to see actually last year, my church do was put together an information session on vaccines. So this was in the early days when and I mean, there still is so much misinformation on vaccines out there. And my church knew that they had a role to play in this. And so they put together an expert panel of doctors and researchers um, who were members of the church, actually. And the entire congregation tuned in virtually to hear their expertise. And there were many people who asked questions, lots of people who were skeptical about this and had their questions answered from a scientific perspective. And this is not an issue that my church would have engaged in previously, mm -hmm. but I was thrilled to see it. And I would really like to see more of that given the climate we're in, given the extent of the misinformation out there and how it can lead some people astray. The church needs to recognize that it has a role to play in this. Brian, I want to hear your thoughts on that. I want to add to that question. Is the church ready for another pandemic? We know that pandemics are, are part of our lives and they will be a part of our future. Uh, what questions do we need to stare in the face of in order to leave this pandemic prepared for the next one? Yeah, you're right. I mean, they do come around every 100 years or so. And I found it interesting at the beginning of the pandemic, people were referring back to Martin Luther uh, and some of his things, uh, some of his sayings that were coming out uh, when, the, when the plague was in Europe. Um, so is it ready? I'm not sure it is. Like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of formation that we have to do uh, with regard to the church's relationship to the scientific community and the medical community. I, I'm glad that Moira is doing her work. Uh, and I think their, their critical uh, organization is critical. But we do have to ask ourselves, what is 
um, the role of medicine uh, in public life. And I think we also have to reacquaint ourselves with the fact that um, we are all deeply interconnected. And I think that's one thing that um, you just can't get away with. Um, and the pandemic has shown us this, that your health may matter to you, but it's also deeply connected with other people and it will affect them. And on the one hand, I think that's actually an opportunity for the church to simply say, we're all dependent upon one another. That's physically as well as spiritually. Um, and that's an opportunity for a church where people I think are increasingly lonely uh, and the pandemic has just made that worse. That was already happening prior to. Um, but I do think there's some work to be done yet in uh, with regard to science. And I think that the Christian community um, out of which the scientific uh, approach, particularly with regard to medicine emerged, we need to recover some of those early histories of the church's engagement with, with, with plagues, with pandemics. I'm thinking about the Cappadocian fathers who stayed in cities that were, were affected by plagues. And it was a massive missional tool. Everyone would see how much they loved the sick, how much they reached out to them, how much they cared for them and, 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 and gave aid to them. And it led to a massive growth. And I think that um, we can see some of these things like medicine and some of the social relationships uh, that accompany it as not just good for the church in terms of its growth, but also in terms of the love of our neighbor. And I think, I think that'll be critical for the next 100 years, and we've got some time to prepare. Maybe even sooner, Brian, maybe even sooner, sooner. who knows? I heard Let's somebody say this is like the biggest group project and we might be failing. So, so we don't know how, how this is all going to end up, but let's work together on this group project. Yeah, I so agree with you, Brian. Thank you again, Jackie, Moira, and Brian for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you Maggie. Thank you. I often think about what life was like just two short years ago, what life was like without masks, bubbles, isolation, and online schooling. And the word that comes to mind is freedom. But what also comes to mind is how much we took that freedom for granted, how we took going to church, hanging out with loved ones, even going for vacation for granted. But do we lament on the past or carve a new way forward? Smarter, wiser, not wasting the lessons learned, but embracing the hard change it might cause us to endure. I'll choose the latter, looking forward to the possibilities in front of us. Thank you for watching. Let us know what you think of today's topic. Join the conversation on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For all of us here, I'm Maggie John. See you next time. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Centre for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing context. You can write to Crossroads, PO Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs. Context Beyond the Headlines invites you to an exciting new season. This year, we're expanding our reach with a brand new podcast that will explore the interaction between faith, justice, culture, ethics, and society. As we move forward with this brand new season and the launch of this brand new podcast, would you consider partnering with Context financially? It is because of the generosity of viewers like you that we're able to continue to tell the stories that matter.